Welcome to the Department of Consumer Affairs Weekly Wednesday webinar. Today's topic is on some of the laws regarding consumer leases and rental purchase agreements. My name is Adam Burr. I'm one of the attorneys here at the department. I help protect consumers by making sure that businesses follow the law. Usually when I'm asked to give a presentation, I'm speaking to businesses about their various legal duties. So it's nice to be able to speak to consumers about some of the laws the department administers and enforces. First, we have the legal disclaimer. This presentation is not meant to serve as a substitute for reading the various laws discussed, seeking legal counsel, or otherwise requesting department guidance and or interpretations on the laws it administers and enforces. The presentation merely serves as an introduction and an overview. So now let's go over some general terminology about consumer leases and rent to own transactions. First, a lessor is the person making the lease. So with consumer leases and rental purchase agreements, the lessor will be the business. The lessee is the person receiving the lease. So with consumer leases and rental purchase agreements, the lessee will be you. Now a consumer lease is a lease of goods, primarily for personal, family, or household purposes, where the amount payable under the lease does not exceed $115,000, and the lease term exceeds four months. So probably the most common type of consumer lease is a car lease. So I'll use that as an example. Now typically the amount you pay to lease is the difference between the purchase price and what's called the residual value. The residual value is the predetermined value at the end of the lease period. Now I saw on the internet about some car salesmen will mention residual based financing when selling cars. Now, if you get residual based financing, you are not buying a car. Instead, you are leasing a car. The money factor is another important concept in consumer leases. It is a method for determining the financing charges on a lease with monthly payments. While it is not the same thing as a finance charge, it is a similar concept to the finance charge that you find with consumer loans and credit sales. Now the money factor is typically a very small number that is less than one. And if you multiply the money factor by 2400, then you'll get an approximate equivalent to an APR. Typically, the better your credit score, the lower your money factor will be. Now, I also saw on the internet that a car salesman didn't want to inform a consumer about the consumer's interest rate during the sales negotiations. Instead, he stated that the APR depends on the money factor, hoping that the consumer would not know any better. Don't be fooled a money factor is only used for leasing. Now with an open end lease, you must purchase the good at the end of the lease period for a predetermined amount. With a closed end lease, you have the option to return the good at the end of the lease period. So if I have to buy the car at the end of the lease period, it is an open end lease. If I have the option to either buy the car at the end of the lease period or return it to the dealer, then it is a closed end lease. Now, a rental purchase agreement or a rent to own transaction is an agreement for the use of personal property, for personal, family, or household purposes, for an initial period of four months or less that is automatically renewable with each payment and permits you to become the owner of the property. So rent to own transactions are most common with furniture, consumer electronics, appliances, or lawn equipment. So now that you understand the basic terms, we'll go over what you need to know before entering into these lease or rent to own contracts. For consumer leases, if the advertisement includes a statement of the amount of any payment or a statement that no initial payment is required, then as applicable, the advertisement must state that the transaction is a lease, 
the total amount of the initial payments required before the lease begins or the property is delivered, whether a security deposit is required, the number, amount, and timing of the scheduled payments, and if your liability at the end of the lease term is based on the anticipated residual value that extra charges may be imposed. In a radio advertisement for a consumer lease, the advertisement must clearly and conspicuously state all the information we talked about on the last slide and the number, amounts, due dates, and the total of the payments. The radio advertisement must include either a referral to a toll-free number to obtain all the information that we talked about on the last slide or a referral to a written advertisement that appears in a publication and general circulation in the community during the period beginning three days prior to the radio broadcast and ending 10 days after the broadcast. And it includes the information that we discussed from the previous slide, as well as the names and dates of the publication. Also, in advertising, leases, cannot use the terms annual percentage rate, annual lease rate, or any other equivalent term. Lessors may not advertise regarding rates, terms, or conditions of credit that are false, misleading, or deceptive. Advertising that complies with the Truth and Lending Act does not violate the prohibition on false, misleading, or deceptive conditions or deceptive terms regarding the conditions of credit. Sorry, got a little bit ahead of myself. Now, I know we're talking about leasing and I said Truth and Lending Act. That's because the Truth and Lending Act has specific provisions pertaining to consumer leases. The motor vehicle dealers also have some additional requirements regarding advertising. For rent-to-own transactions, the advertisement must state that the transaction is a rent-to-own transaction and that you will not own the property unless you pay the full amount or prepay as authorized by law. Now, if the advertisement is for a specific item, it must also state the total of all payments necessary to acquire ownership of that item. So here's an excerpt from our consumer auto buying guide found on our website. These tips can also be used for car leases. Some of our tips include reading the fine print so you will know if any exclusions apply and whether you qualify for any rebates or discounts. See if the closing fee is disclosed and included in the advertised price. See if the vehicle is marked new or used with the year, make, and model included. Now, most of the time, a lease will be for a new vehicle, but a used vehicle lease is not impossible. Be leery of advertisements using the word free. Also note that it is illegal for an advertisement to guarantee the value or range of value for your trade-in. So here's an excerpt from our dealer's guide, which is also found on our website. By reviewing the dealer's guide, you can be aware of what dealers must do in order for their advertisements to be considered legally compliant. Now here are some licensing and registration requirements, specifically what is available on the department's website to assist you in doing your research before you enter into that car lease. You can look on our website for a listing of all the industries that we regulate. However, specifically as it relates to leases, the closing fee notification will likely be the most helpful filing in your research. Any auto dealer that wants to charge a closing fee must file a closing fee notification with the department. The dealer has to file the notification and the department has to say it is reasonable. What gets permitted is the maximum amount of a closing fee that the dealer may charge. The dealer is not required to charge a closing fee at all and may charge you less. The closing fee that gets permitted is just the maximum amount that a dealer could charge. So here's where you can find the closing fee notification on our website. 
On our home page, scroll down until you see the link for licensee lookup. You click that link and then scroll down until you see the closing fees spreadsheet. So now let's cover some of the laws pertaining to consumer leases. Leases are governed by the Consumer Protection Code, the leasing provisions of the Truth and Lending Act, and Regulation M. So with leasing, you rent the property for a set period of time, say two to three years. For car leases, you're allowed to drive a set number of miles, usually between 12,000 and 15,000 miles per year. You're essentially paying for the depreciation in the value of the property. At the end of the lease, you can return the property, assuming it's a closed-end lease. If there is any excessive wear and tear or excessive miles for a car, then you will likely be charged for that. You may also be charged a disposition fee when you eventually return the property. A disposition fee is um, a fee paid at the end of the lease period to dispose of the property. An example might be a refurbishment fee to get the property in good enough condition to sell as used to another consumer. Now, your monthly lease payment will be based upon the property's sale price, the property's residual value, and the money factor. Now, leasing has some benefits. Leasing is frequently, but not always, less expensive than purchasing. New vehicle leases typically end before vehicles require major service or new tires, so maintenance costs with leasing are usually low. And new vehicle leases are typically covered by the manufacturer's original factory warranty. Leasing also has some drawbacks. When you lease, you do not own the property. For new vehicle leases, there's the potential for excessive mileage fees. The average consumer drives between 1,000 and 1,200 miles per month. So a couple major road trips could put you over the mileage limit. Your insurance can also be higher for new vehicle leases as leasing companies often require higher levels of insurance than individuals carry for cars that they bought. Now leases should provide a brief description of the lease property, the amount of any payment required at the beginning of the lease, the amounts for official fees, registration, certificate of title, or license fees or taxes. The amount of any other charges which are not included in the periodic payments, a description of these charges, and a statement that you will be liable for the difference between the anticipated fair market value of the property and its actual fair market value at the end of the lease if you do in fact have that liability. Now, leases should also provide a statement of how liability at the end of the lease is determined, a statement of whether you have the option to purchase at the end of the lease and at what price and time, a statement identifying express warranties and guarantees, and identifying who is responsible for maintaining or servicing the property with a description of that responsibility a brief description of insurance, and a description of any security interest retained by the lessor and a clear indication of the property related to that security interest. Now, leases should also provide the number, amount, and due dates for payments and the total amount of the periodic payments. If the lease provides that you will be liable for the anticipated fair market value at the end of the lease, then you should be provided with a statement informing you of the fair market value at the beginning of the lease, the aggregate costs at the end of the lease, and the difference between the two. You should also be provided with a statement explaining the conditions for early termination, as well as any payments for, uh, or excuse me, any penalties for delinquency, default, late payments, or early termination. Now, all of the required disclosures can be included as part of the leasing contract. So at the end of Regulation M, there are some model disclosure forms for leases. 
Here is a model open in vehicle lease disclosure form. Now I picked two disclosures on each page of each form so we could see that the appropriate disclosures are actually there. So here we can see the amount due at signing and the monthly payments. Here we can see the liability at the end of the lease term and the warranties. So here's a model closed and vehicle lease disclosure form. So here we can see the other charges not included in the monthly payments and the purchase option at the end of the lease. Here we can see insurance requirements and conditions for early termination and default. So here is the model furniture lease disclosure form. So here we can see disclosures for official fees and taxes and the maintenance responsibilities. And here we can see disclosures about a security interest and late payments. So new disclosures are required for a renegotiation, meaning that the lease is satisfied and you take out a new lease. New disclosures are not required for extensions unless the extension exceeds six months. If someone assumes a lease, if the rent charges are reduced, if a payment is deferred, if the property is substituted with a substantially equivalent or greater economic value, or for the addition, deletion, or substitution of property in a multiple item lease, if the average periodic payment does not change by more than 25%. Now, when you enter into a consumer lease, the residual value must be reasonable. There is a rebuttable presumption that the residual value is unreasonable if the estimated residual value exceeds the actual residual value by more than three times the average monthly payment. There is a rebuttable presumption that the estimated residual value was not made in good faith if the estimated residual value exceeds the actual residual value by more than three times the average monthly payment. You are not liable for that excess amount at the end of the lease unless the lessor successfully sues you. Now, late charges cannot be assessed until you are more than 10 days past the due date. They are limited to the lesser of 5% of the missed payment or $23 unless a minimum late charge is contracted for. In that case, the minimum delinquency charge cannot exceed $9.20. A late charge can only be assessed once per missed payment, regardless of how long the payment remains unpaid. A lessor is required to give you a written receipt for each payment. A periodic statement showing the payment is sufficient. So an example would be your monthly statements. Upon written request, a lessor must provide you with a written statement of the dates and amounts paid within the last 12 months. The statement must be provided to you at no cost at least once per year. After you have paid off the debt, the lessor must provide you with written evidence acknowledging that payment has been made in full. If a person other than the spouse of the consumer agrees to be a cosigner, that person must be given notice that he or she may have to pay back the debt if the consumer fails to pay it. The notice must be in writing, signed by the cosigner, and must be clear and conspicuous. If the required notice is not given and signed, the co-signer is not obligated to repay the debt. A lessor may not take a security interest in your property to secure the debt arising from the lease. Now keep in mind that the rented property is not yours. It belongs to the lessor. So the lessor can have a security interest in its own property. 
If you default on your obligations and the lessor follows all the rules, the lessor can repossess its own property. However, it cannot take a security interest in your property. If the lessor does take a security interest in your property to secure the debt arising from the lease, then that interest is void. Attorney's fees are limited to 15% of the unpaid debt after default. Additionally, the attorney cannot be a salaried employee of either the lessor or the assignee. Now, if you have been in default for more than 10 days and you have not voluntarily returned the property, you must receive a right to cure before the property can be repossessed or before that debt is accelerated. You have 20 days to cure the default. You can cure the default by paying all unpaid amounts due as well as any late fees. Curing the default restores your rights under the agreement as if the default never occurred. Now you are entitled to one right to cure notice for the entire term of the agreement. So let's say that you sign a three-year lease. You miss the second payment. The business sends you a right to cure and you cure the default. You go an additional two years without missing a single payment. However, you miss a payment in the third year. The business does not have to send you another right to cure notice before repossessing that car. Now let's cover some of the laws pertaining to rental purchase agreements, also known as rent to own transactions. Rent to own transactions are governed by the Consumer Protection Code. So with rent to own, you rent the property for a set period of time. You make payments typically weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. At the end of the lease, you have the option to become the owner of the property, or you can return the property. A rent to own does have some benefits. First, the payments themselves are fairly inexpensive. This is a way to have and use property now when your credit history is less than stellar, you do not have a credit history, or you cannot save to buy the item later. So let's say that your refrigerator stops running and you need a new one. You don't have a stellar credit history. A refrigerator is an appliance that you would really need immediately and it would not be practical to save up to buy a new refrigerator. Rent to own could be a useful tool for you to get that refrigerator now. Rent to own can also be an option to build or rebuild a favorable credit history. Now, rent to own is an effective extended trial period before fully committing to acquiring the property. So let's say you see a sofa in the store that you want for your living room. After you get the sofa, you discover that the sofa does not fit well in the space that you have. Returning the sofa might be more of a hassle if you bought the sofa outright instead of a, obtaining the sofa through a rent to own transaction. And another benefit is that since you can return the property at any time, you can easily walk away from an obligation should your financial circumstances change. Now, rent to own also has some drawbacks. You do not own the property until you make all required payments. And while the payments themselves are inexpensive, the total amount of payments necessary to acquire ownership often makes rent to own one of the most expensive ways to purchase property. A rent to own contract is required to give you the total of the scheduled payments, the number, amount and timing of the payments, including any taxes required to be paid to become the owner of the property, a statement that you will not own the property until you have made all the required payments, a statement that the total payments does not include any late charges, and a statement that you are responsible for the fair market value of the property if the property is lost, stolen, damaged, or destroyed. A rent to own contract is also required to give you a statement of whether the property is new or used, 
in the statement that at any time after you make the first payment, you may obtain ownership by paying 55% of the difference between the scheduled payments and the amount you already paid. Now, a renegotiation occurs when one agreement is satisfied and replaced with a new agreement. And with a few exceptions, a renegotiation is considered a new agreement requiring new disclosures. Late fees in a rent-to-own contract depend upon your payment frequency. If your payment frequency is monthly or less frequently than monthly, such as every two months, then the late fee cannot exceed $18.40, and it cannot be charged until after five business days after the payment is due or the property is to be returned. Now, if your payment frequency is more frequently than monthly, such as weekly, then the late fee cannot exceed $9.20, and it cannot be charged until after three business days after the payment is due or the property is to be returned. Late fees can only be charged once per scheduled payment, regardless of how long the scheduled payment remains unpaid. Rent to own companies can also charge you some other fees. You can be charged an initial non refundable fee not to exceed $5. Delivery fees cannot exceed $15 if there are five or fewer items or $45 if there are more than five items. They can only be charged if the items are actually delivered to your home and the charges are disclosed. The delivery charge cannot be in addition to the initial non-refundable fee. Now, a fee to pick up payment from your home cannot exceed $7. This fee can only be charged three times in a six month period if the payment frequency is less than monthly, or six times in a six month period if the payment frequency is more than monthly. After you make the first payment, you may return the rented property, continue making periodic payments or renewals under the terms of the agreement, or purchase the property by paying 55% of the difference between the total scheduled payments and the total amount paid. If you fail to make payments, you have the right to reinstate the original agreement without losing any rights or options you previously had. If you are not more than 60 days in default, you miss one payment and you surrender the property if requested within the time when the payment was missed. You may have to pay the outstanding balance of any accrued payments, late charges, or delivery charges. You have the right to receive the same item or substitute item of comparable quality and condition. If you have been in default for more than three business days and you have not voluntarily returned the property, you must receive a right to cure before court action is initiated against you to recover the property. The amount of time that you have to cure the default depends on your payment frequency. If your payment frequency is monthly or less frequently than monthly, then you have five days to cure the default. If your payment frequency is more frequently than monthly, you have three days to cure the default. You can cure the default by paying all unpaid amounts due as well as any late fees. Curing the re default restores your rights under the agreement as if default never occurred. And you are only entitled to one right to cure notice for the entire term of the agreement. So now let's look at some rights that are common to both leases and rent to own transactions. The lessor may not take a negotiable instrument other than a post dated check of not more than 10 days as evidence of your obligation. The lessor cannot garnish your wages for payment or security for payment of a debt. However, you can authorize payroll deductions to pay the debt if that authorization is revocable. 
Occasionally, the lessor may sell or assign your debt to another business. You have the right to pay the original creditor until you receive notice that rights to payment have been assigned and that payment must be made to the assignee. You may request proof that assignment has been made. After the assignment, the assignee is subject to all of the claims and defenses you have against that original lessor. However, you may assert a claim or defense against an assignee only if you have made a good faith effort to obtain satisfaction from the original lessor. Lastly, you may not authorize someone else to confess judgment on a claim arising out of a consumer lease or rent to own transaction. All right, I don't see any questions. Bailey, did <laughs> any questions come in? If they did, yep, can you read them out? Yep, I'll read them to you real quick. Okay. So first one is, is rent, and rent is in, in quotations, as in an apartment or dwelling, a lease. Are, um, there's multiple questions here, so okay. I'll let you answer that, and then I'll go on to the next one. Uh, so is that considered a lease, like renting an apartment? So renting an apartment is considered a lease, but it's not a consumer lease because a consumer lease is only for a lease of goods. Okay. And then the next one is, um, I mean, this probably applies. So like store, they want to know if storage units are leases too. So, a, so a storage unit, you're leasing the space of the storage unit, but it's not considered a consumer lease because it's not a good. Okay. So you're 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 entering into a contract for a service. The storage company is providing you with a service that you can store your stuff at that storage facility, but it's not a good, if that makes sense. So it's not subject to the consumer leasing provisions of the Consumer Protection Code. It's subject to additional laws which weren't covered in this webinar. Okay. Um, and next question is, are, is it, um, is it lessers pronounced? <laughs> lessers allowed to report non-payment or missed payments to the credit bureaus? They are. Um, okay. So a, a consumer lease is considered the same um, from like a legal perspective as a credit sale. So if you lease the car or if you buy the car, if you don't make those payments and the lessor follows all the rules, the lessor can report those missed payments to the credit bureaus, which would have a negative impact on your credit score. Okay. Um, next question. I, um, does your department review all leases? Um, and I, I could probably answer that. No. Um, and leases aren't filed with our department, right, Adam? Right. Uh, typically, the department would only review a lease if there was a reason to review the lease, uh, such as a consumer filed a complaint, and with the complaint, we noticed something odd about that lease. Okay. And um, this, you kind of just answer the next question. If the department does review them, can they review them upon request? So you said that, you know, if you file a complaint and it involves a lease, we would look over that. Yes, absolutely. If you file a complaint, um, one of the things we ask for with complaints are supporting documentation, uh, one of which would be that lease. So our, um, typically that would probably be assigned to the legal team for we have our complaints are divided into the services and legal and legal team reviews if there's an alleged violation of the law. Um, so the legal team would review the lease to see if there's anything out of the ordinary. Now keep in mind that neither myself nor any of my colleagues can provide you with any legal advice concerning the terms of the lease. We can just look at the lease and see if the lease complies with the provisions of the Consumer Protection Code. If you're looking for legal advice before entering into that lease, you need to seek out a private attorney. Okay. 
And then the last part um, of this is, is layaway a lease. So like the, I'm assuming like layaway payments to pay for something. So layaway actually would not be considered a consumer lease. Layaway would be considered a consumer credit sale um, because the definition of a credit sale is if you um, are paying a finance charge or if it's four or more installments. And usually with layaway, it's going to be four or more installments before you acquire ownership of the good. So with layaway, you put the good on layaway, the business typically keeps it in its back office to keep it out of inventory, and then you make payments on it according to the terms of the contract. And once you fulfill all your payment obligations, you've now acquired ownership of the good. So it's more like it's a credit sale. It's not a, considered a consumer lease. Okay. Next question is, on a rent-to-own deal, can the lessee halt the contract at any time, example, like after four to six months, and return the property? Yes, the lessee has the right at any time before the um, contract is fulfilled to return the item. So if your financial situation changes, you have the right to return that item. You can walk away from it and no longer be responsible for it. Now, you don't necessarily have that same right for consumer leases. That's a right for rent to own. Okay. The next one is how long uh, does your rent to own last? And I'm assuming that probably has to do with like the contract that you sign maybe. So how long does a rent to own contract last? Yeah, yeah yes, it, it, just, depends. it depends on the contractual terms. Okay. Um, and then, oh, uh, they provided additional details. Um, Say they told you the house is seventy-seven thousand, and you would pay it off in five or ten years. Does, so I'm assuming if does that mean that the rent to own lasts for the length of um, until they say you pay it off? So the provisions of the rent to own, uh, the Consumer Protection Code, only apply to consumer goods, so household goods, not the house itself. So the the house is an interest in land, so it's not subject to the Consumer Protection Code and not subject to the rental purchase agreement provisions of the Consumer Protection Code. There are other laws that apply. Okay. So this is why you you're... To, those are mostly governed by contract laws, so you'd have to look at the individual contract. Okay. And uh, th I said this is why you give the presentation, Adam, and not me, because... <laughs> I know none of this. Uh, and it looks like there that's the um, rest of the complaints. There were a couple of, uh, not complaints, um, uh, questions. There were a couple of questions that I answered um, for links. Uh, somebody did ask a really good question that I'm going to send to the entire group of where can you view complaints against a company. Um, so I'm going to send that to everyone. You can search through our complaint portal. I just sent the link. Um, for any business, if nothing comes up, that just means that we haven't had a complaint against that particular business. Um, obviously, PII is not on there, so private identifying information, uh, just kind of the nature of the complaint, who it's against, when it was filed, and how it was resolved, if it's been resolved. So I sent that link to everyone, and I think that's, that's everything, Adam. All right, you guys have been a great audience today. Uh, thank you for watching this presentation, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day.